Isn't it about time for somebody's favorite radio program? This is America's Outdoor Talk program. Are you ready to get rowdy? Outdoors This Week with your host, Alex Langer. Alex Langer. We've got fishing. Believe me, folks, I have been there, and the fishing has been tremendous. Hiking. Adios. Have a nice trip. Camping. This is a real adventure. How do you know? When you're an experienced woodsman like me, you get a feel for these things. Oh, really? Heck, we've even got kayaking. I'm going to show you kids the time of your life. We've got all the info you need for a safe and fun day in the sun. It's a darn good thing we found you when we did. There's something horrible roaming these woods. And you've got Outdoors This Week. Outdoors This Week. And now, here's your host, Alex Langer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Announcer. And we have a treat for you guys, guys and gals today. And that is, Lynn, you listen to. We we have a bunch of northern gentlemen, which are right up the road here. Oh, that's awesome. They're they're not a thousand miles away like Larry and and, and whoever else you're in love with. Yeah, I don't have to go fly (laughs) to see them. That's right. You can save your airline (laughs) tickets and buy gas, which is probably just as expensive these days. We have two of the captains from a brand new, exciting show on the National Geographic Channel called Wicked Tuna, which which is produced locally right here outside of Boston. And uh, for those of you listening around the country, that would be Gloucester, Mass., which is probably the first fishing port ever in the United States. For those of you who have ever seen the Gordon's Fisherman, that's the Gloucester Gloucester Fisherman. Fisherman. And and that's it. So today we have two of the Wicked Tuna guys. We have uh, Captain Dave Marciano from the Hard Merchandise, and he's going to be with us. And Captain Dave Carrero, uh, he's from Tuna.com, that's the name of the vessel, and Carrero is, is a New Jersey native who grew up fishing the waters near his home, but he's also an airline pilot. And uh, we'll, we'll talk to him about both tuna and airplanes. Tuna can sometimes be as big as an airplane. And then then Dave Marciano, he is one of the memorable captains on the show. Uh, he is the son of an insurance man up in Beverly, Mass., but he decided to go into fish, not insurance, and uh, he, he also fishes down in Key West. There's a boat that ran out of Gloucester, which actually I, I fished on in, out of Key West, called the Yankee Caps, and he was a mate on that boat for a number of years. And then he went off and he started to hunt the big eye tuna. So stay with us, folks. Obviously, it's going to be it's gonna be a bumpy ride. But then we have all of Lynn's Southern Gentlemen. Don't waste your time on the Yay. Southern Gentlemen. All right. <laughs> we'll be right back, folks. Tight. More of America's Outdoor Talk program, Outdoors This Week, after this. Hi folks, Ron Linder here for lindermedia.com, one of the world's most exciting websites. Or you can go see us on Facebook at Angling Edge. Facebook, Facebook, Angling Edge. Either one, or you can watch us on television. We're still playing on some channels. WFN is one. If you get that network, we're still playing on some of the channels. Anyway, ta-da, ta-da, ta-da. It is learning time. Or anomaly time. Better yet, it's anomaly time. Many species of fish in freshwater are called adronomous, which means that they spend most of their life at sea in, in the salt water and then swim back to freshwater to spawn. Examples include steelhead, Pacific salmon, striped bass, most of which uh, most folks have heard of. And actually, in places, uh, 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 some areas, people have caught uh, fish like the steelhead. Uh, Where I live in Minnesota, you go to Lake Superior, you catch them over there. But only one fish in all of our fresh waters is a catadromous fish, and that is the American eel. The female spends most of its life in the freshwater river and then goes out to sea to spawn. Yes, the American eel makes one of the longest spawning migration runs of any fish in all of North America. Uh, after living most of their lives in big rivers here like the Mississippi and others, uh, when spawning time approaches, they swim downstream to join the males at the river mouth. They then swim to a strange place called the Sargasso Sea, which is a whole bunch of weeds, which is way out in the middle of the North Atlantic, and that's where they spawn. 
in over a half century, I've been dragging artificial lures and live baits all over North America and even Europe. I have caught one American eel. And that was a two-pounder that came out of the St. Louis River near Duluth, Minnesota, while Lindy Rigging put live bait with a night caller for walleyes. I did that about 25 years ago. I have never bumped into another one since. Uh, just for kicks, I'd like to catch one more uh, uh, one more of these strange, strange critters. And by the way, they're supposed to eat great. At least that's what they say in Europe. That's it for now. And until later, see you later, Alex. Fishing the Piers, coming up on Bass Pro Shops Outdoor World. Would you like to spend less time on the couch and more time in the fresh air? Would you like your kids to stare at a bobber instead of the TV? Would you gladly trade in your microwave for a Dutch oven? Then you belong at Bass Pro Shops. Every week, we offer free skills workshops to help you get started. See the store or go to BassPro.com for more information. Bass Pro Shops, your adventure starts here. Pier fishing can be great fun. It's something you can do alone or with friends. Do it all day or for only an hour. Just remember that it's called fishing and not catching. Knowing what kinds of fish are there will help you prepare and will help you know what kind of gear and bait to use while pier fishing. Different fish eat different things. So if you want to catch a specific type of fish from the pier, then make sure you're fishing with the correct type of bait. You can buy live bait, dead bait, lures, chum, or you can catch your own live bait. Remember too that different fish are active at different times of the day or night. Some fish you can only keep so many of, and some you can't keep at all. You'll need to know the current laws. Some fish also have seasons and can only be kept in those seasons. You'll also need to know if you need a fishing license to be pure fishing in your state. Now for more interesting facts, outdoor tips, and more, go to BassPro.com and click on News and Tips. I'm Larry Whiteley, and this is Bass Pro Shops Outdoor World. Thanks, Larry, and you're fishing for bass, Larry, but these guys that I'm going to interview right now are fishing for tuna. That's the real stuff. I'm talking giant tuna. L let me tell you about my, my first guest. Uh, Dave Marciano is, is captain of the boat called Hard Merchandise. He is from Gloucester, Mass., and he is one of the key people on Wicked Tuna. First of all, Dave, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Well, Dave, where are you right now? Are you at home? Are you out on the boat? Where are you? No, actually, the boat's hauled out of the water right at the moment, and I'm sitting in the truck right beside the boat, and we're in the middle of uh, repowering the boat. So we're hauling out the old engine that had about 23,000 hours on it. It was a Cummins diesel, and we're going to put a... Uh, new engine in for this season, upcoming season. How, how often do you have to repower the boat? Well, that one, you know, it's, it's about the end of its lifespan, normally about 20,000 hours for a marine diesel, and that one was about 10 years old, so, you know, it's time for a new one. She was getting tired. You're not just a cap, you're the whole package, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm chief uh, cook and bottle washer, as they say. I do it all. I, you know, I, that's how it is. This This isn't a yacht for me. This is um, you know, how I employ myself and how I feed my family. So, you know, whenever possible, I do as much as I possibly can myself. And, uh, you know, just on occasion, I call in the professionals uh, when I get to projects that are out of my league. You started in, in Key West. I'm well familiar with Key West. I go down there once in a while. And you crewed in a, on a boat down there, did you? Yes, yes. That was part of my career. I actually started on the body boats in Gloucester. And on one of those potty boats, it used to fish down in Key West. I think I know the boat. Was it Yankee Caps? That's correct. I spent <laughs> a lot of years. I've I've worn out a lot of deck boots running around the boat of the Yankee Caps. I actually fished in the Yankee Caps once in my life. So, yeah, I, I did a radio show right from the captain's uh, captain's booth or whatever you want to call it. And yeah. I, I asked the guy to turn off his electronics. And he, he refused. I said, this is a boat. <laughs> so, Dave, I've watched Wicked Tuna. What is the most difficult part of being a captain? Um, you know, it, it's really the decision process. Right. You know, uh, that's something I always struggle with because... You know, the decisions I make are going to have a direct result on whether Jay and I, my nephew, is on the boat with me, yeah. you know, whether we make a paycheck or not. Yeah. So, you know, literally we got a lot riding on, on every choice I make. And, you know, sometimes I make the right decision and we go out and make a nice big paycheck. And sometimes I make the wrong decision and we don't make any money at all. Right. Or worse, you know, there's the safety factor. You know, a lot of times we're dealing with the weather and I have to deal, I have to you know, decide on 
exactly how far I can push the limit. You're juggling all these things at the same time in your head. How do you deal with it all? I'm a fisherman. I, I've done it all, but I really have not had to do it for a living. I get to talk about it, but you actually live it. Yeah, and, and you know, look, I smoke a lot, which, by the way, I'm in that, the process of trying to quit now. <laughs> okay, that's good. I, I used to smoke myself. <laughs> you know, and, and, you know it, it is very stressful, but, you know, ultimately I consider myself to be a professional doing what I do for a living. Right. And, you know, like any professionals out there, we have to, um, you know, get adjusted with, you know, dealing with it when we make a right decision and when we make a wrong decision. It's just... It's part of the business. Right, right. Let me ask you this. You'll appreciate it, you know, having fish in the Florida Keys. Are we going to wipe out the tuna anytime soon? No, no. I, I mean, we've definitely had problems in the past. But remember now, for over 20 years, we've been working to rebuild this stock. Right. Uh, and, and we're starting to see results of that rebuilding. Uh, the next current stock assessment, which I guess at this point is waiting to be peer-reviewed by scientists, is definitely uh, a positive note. You know, the stock is on the increase. It's not at its historic by um, its historic abundance level, but it's definitely building back its way there. And like some of the ways we do this, like a lot of fisheries, you know, we have size limits on these fish. And with these giant tuna, the minimum size we can keep for sale is a 73-inch fish. So, you know, that's basically a six-foot fish or a 200-pound fish right. before it's even big enough for us to keep. Right. You don't catch any football-sized tuna. I remember we, we were shooting a TV show once. We were down off Rhode Island, and we were catching football-sized tuna. Is that even legal these days? Um, yes. No, the, that is a part of our fishery. Um, but when we're commercial fishing, uh, we can't um, sell the footballs. Now, we do have quite a charter boat fleet up here in Gloucester, and they are allowed to target the football tuna, but they have their own separate quota, which is, you know, they use the, the science, you know, bases all the facts of the size of fish when they set these quotas. And, um, you know, it, it's definitely part of the fishery. Right. And on the show, we do catch shorts on, on occasion, you know, those smaller fish, the footballs, if you will. Yeah. And uh, we usually release them unharmed. Yeah. Uh, listen, listen, we, we got to go to a break. Would you come back for another segment, Dave? <laughs> Absolutely. All right, folks, we'll be right back on Outdoors This Week with Captain Dave, as I like to call him, from Wicked Tuna. Don't go away. Hey, what do you think you're doing? Don't change that dial. Alex will be right back with more of Outdoors This Week after these messages. Papa was a fisherman. He loved his car. Good Tight lines with Sammy Lee. Are you one of those anglers that just can't seem to catch bass out of shallow water during the spring? Well, don't feel too badly because you're not alone. Hello, this is Sammy Lee. Today I'll talk about the various ways to catch fish in shallow water and how to improve your catch this year in thin water. But first, this message. Your best tool for catching big fish isn't even in your tackle box. It's FishMate Pro, the app that loads your smartphone up with everything you need to catch the big ones. You get the best feeding times in the moon phase, plus all your current weather conditions, including barometric pressure and color weather radar. And when you catch a trophy, take a picture on the phone and FishMate Pro interfaces with Facebook and Twitter. Plus, you get recipes, fishing news, and podcasts updated every weekday right in the palm of your hand. Bring more fun to your fishing with the FishMate Pro app. Find out all you need to know at FishMateApp.com. You know, springtime is the ideal time to fish shallow water because large female fish, especially bass, will be moving up to find spawning areas. The key here to successfully catching these fish is to find the places where conditions will be right for fish to spawn. You'll need to look for harder bottom areas like gravel beds, pea gravel points, and roadways. While cover always seems to be a preference, this is one time when it's not an absolute necessity. And oftentimes by looking at the above water terrain, you'll get a clue as to what the bottom looks like below the surface. Hardwoods such as oak, birch, and beech may indicate a bottomland that is soft and unsuitable for spawning because before the lake was filled with water, this area would probably have had soft, rich soil helped by the falling leaves from these trees. However, pine trees, on the other hand, may mean a harder bottom since pines grow best in firmer, sandy types of land. And by using your depth finder, you can locate vast flats where pine trees once grew 
which are frequently preferred by spawning fish. Now, points are other good places to try, as are coves. But remember that these bottom conditions that I talked about a moment ago can change rapidly. So be sure to keep an eye on the water temperature as well, because this is one of the keys to spawning activity. Shallow water warms more quickly than deep water, and some fish have been known to deposit their eggs in as deep as 15 feet of water. I'll be back with more tight lines after these messages and a few words about my next program on shallow water, so don't go away. I'll continue giving you shallow water tips that will help you catch more bass this spring on my next program, so I hope you'll join me for that. I'm Sammy Lee, and until next time, Tight Lines. Tight Lines, brought to you by FishMate, the ultimate fishing app for your smartphone. By UFP, America's leading maker of brake systems for boat trailers. And by SmartBaits, color changes everything. Follow Tight Lines on Twitter at www.twitter.com backslash Tight Lines Radio. Uh, th- thank you, Sammy. We're, we're back, and we have with us Dave Marciano. And Dave is the captain of a boat called the Hard Merchandise. It's seen on National Geographic's uh, new program called Wicked Tuna. Now, you're in your second year this year, right, Dave? Season two that's airing now. Oh, now, okay. Sunday night is episode five. Give us episode five. What, what's happening on episode five? On episode five, you're going to see that we deal with a lot of sharks here uh, on occasion. In uh, last season in particular, it was brutal. We had um, some great white sharks flying around up here, which is um, unusual, but the water got so hot they seemed to come up this far. And uh, we have we always deal with a lot of blue sharks, which are just a nuisance species, but they're very abundant. And uh, in particular, you'll see me have a pretty nasty run-in with a thresher shark. Really? I mean, in uh, shark populations as well as one of the populations of fish we are managing, and they are increasing. And the problem is, is they're big fish. They're 300-pound-plus fish as well. Right. And, you know, they, they, if we're messing with a shark, we're certainly not going to catch a tuner at that time. So it becomes very frustrating and, at times, very dangerous while we're dealing with these sharks. I hear you. Listen, you were in a shipwreck in 2003. Can you tell me about that? Sure, yeah, that was the boat, the first boat I've owned, um, and I owned it for about 10 years. That was the uh, Angelica Joseph, named after my first two kids. Right. Um, Now, we sank about uh, 18 miles at sea. We were coming home from fishing. It was January 13th, 2003, and that was an old wooden boat because, you know, when you you buy boats, um, wood boats are cheaper. So, you know, that was my first boat. I was starting out in the business, and uh, what happened is, We had a plank let go in that boat, and uh, she sank in 33 minutes from the time I notified the Coast Guard I was having problems to the time I told them we were abandoning ship. We were hitting the fish hard. We were on the fish. We were one of the last boats of that season still on the Pollock, and we had about, you know, 15,000 pounds of Pollock aboard the day we lost the boat. No kidding. What happens if if you got to ditch a boat and go into the water? Um, Well... (laughs) You know, we we have survival suits. Uh, That's required by law as part of our safety equipment. Right. Uh, Now, a survival suit or an exposure suit, it's called, is basically picture like a Gumby suit, right? It it covers your body, everything except your face, and it's kind of like a dry suit. Yeah. Uh, So you can, you know, um, without this suit, you'd probably last only a few minutes in the water. Right. And it's, you know, it keeps you dry and it keeps you afloat, even if you're unconscious you know, they're designed to um, keep you floating face up. Right, right. How long were you in the water? Um, I was in the water about 30 minutes. My crew was in the water much less. I had two people fishing with me at the time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when we when we got to the point, we, we had another fishing boat right, right away was standing by alongside us. Uh, once he heard, he was fishing about a mile away from us. Right. So once he heard we were having trouble, he came right over. So I knew as long as we didn't get, you know, tangled up in the gear on the boat or tangled up in the boat itself, we were going to be fine even if we did hit the water. Now, the crew got into the life raft, which we were towing. We deployed, um, you know, once we started taking on water, and we were towing that behind the boat. Now, um, I, you know, slowed the boat down a little to give the crew a chance to get in the life raft and then I cut the life raft free. Yeah. By this point, I, um, I I put the boat in gear again and kept moving because she was so full of water. 
literally the only thing at this point that was keeping her afloat was the forward momentum. Right. So right. while that was happening, I wound up about a mile from the other boat in the other, picking up the other crewmen out of the life raft. And then eventually the water came up and smothered the engine. So the boat just stopped and she literally squatted and I kind of floated out of the pilot house. Right. And I had to kind of tread water beside the boat for about 30 minutes till the other boat caught up to me. You survived and uh, what did you learn from that experience? Um, Don't use a wooden boat, right? <laughs> well, no. I mean, you know, hey, she was a great boat. I caught a lot of fish with that boat. That boat certainly, um, you know, gave me my start in the business, and she served her purpose. Yeah. <clears throat> but, you know, what I did learn, I mean, being through an experience like that, you know, it's kind of like a car accident. They right. happen all the time. You know, right. boats sink all the time. Well, not all the time, but, you know, it happens. But you never think it's going to be you. Right, ex so exactly. From, from that point, it was a little bit surreal. Did you ever see the movie Perfect Storm? Yes, I did. What did you think of that movie? Was that real or not real? Uh, you know, I think they did a pretty good job. Because remember, you know, the guys aren't here to tell the story like I am. I hear you. So it's it's all speculation on exactly what happened. Right, right. Um, but, you know, it, it, as best I can figure, they definitely did, you know, capture what you know, very well could have happened. Again, unfortunately, we'll never know exactly what happened aboard that boat. The sister of the Andre Gale is docked at the Boston Fish Fair. I don't know if you know that. You can go down there and see it if, if you really feel like it. Dave, what keeps you going? In a, in a minute, t tell me why you tuna fish. Uh, the, re the reason why I tuna fish is fishing in general is my passion. I love all the fisheries I participate in, and I fish year-round. Um you know, so without a doubt, it's definitely a passion. And the tuna fishing is, for sure, the most exciting thing out of all the fisheries I participate in. I mean, when you hook one of these fish, they're a 1,000-pound fish. They're capable of speeds, burst of speeds, up to 30 miles an hour. So I'll, let me tell you, it's wicked exciting when you hook one of these fish. Literally, it's like hooking your fishing rod up to a Volkswagen. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, Dave. So, where are you off to next after this? You're, um, you're gonna you're gonna replace the motor, right? <laughs> yeah, we're gonna replace the motor, and I get a busy charter schedule uh, coming up this season in April. So, uh, we, you know, we're working hard to get the boat all ready and get her all tuned up and begin, uh, you know, the next season, 2013. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll be producing a third season of Wicked Tuna after that. Great, Dave. Uh, we got to run, but thank you for being with us. And we'll watch Wicked Tuna on National Geographic. It's in its second season right now. Thanks a lot. And be careful out there, all right? Uh, all right, man. Thank you very much for having me. Okay. Have a great day. Thanks, Dave. You too. Coast to Coast. This is Outdoors This Week with Alex Langer. It's true. Nothing I can do. Late winter is prime time to catch big catfish in southern and midwestern rivers. These big fish group together on ledges this time of year. Skilled anglers can find them with electronics and catch them on big chunks of cut bait. Some of these big cats can grow up to 100 pounds or more. I'm Wade Bourne, and this is Wired to Fish Radio. In a minute, outdoor writer Keith Sutton asks anglers to keep smaller catfish to eat but put these bigger, older fish back in the water. More Wired to Fish Radio coming up. With the mission to promote, protect, and preserve hunting in the shooting sports, the National Shooting Sports Foundation wants to help you better enjoy your sports. Take a lesson from champion pistol shooter Doug Koenig. Fine-tune your shotgun skills with top instructor Gil Ash, or learn how to sight in your rifle in just two shots. You'll find all the information you need to shoot better at nssf.org slash videos. Watch and learn with NSSF at nssf.org slash videos. Reliable, durable, and fun to shoot are just a few of the ways people describe their experiences with the M&P Pistol Series from Smith & Wesson. Available in multiple calibers and frame sizes, these lightweight, high-strength polymer pistols are fine-tuned machines both inside and out. Designed to meet the needs of law enforcement pros and recreational shooters alike, the M&P Series has you covered no matter your flavor. To learn more about the M&P Pistol Series, visit www.smith-wesson.com. This is Wired to Fish Radio. Arkansas outdoor writer Keith Sutton has written books and magazine articles and done TV shows on catfishing. 
He's a true authority on where to find these whiskered fish and how to catch them. Recently, Keith told me big catfish are most vulnerable to fishing pressure this time of year and late winter. He urges anglers to be good conservationists in terms of maintaining these fish. I always encourage people to practice what is called restrictive harvest. Big fish or older fish. I used to think that a 50-pound catfish might be 20 or 30 years old, and that's probably not the case, but it still may be 5 or 6 or 10 years old, and it takes that long if you take that fish out to replace it with another of that size. There's a lot more small fish. They're just as good, if not better, to eat. So I encourage people, throw anything that's 10 pounds or heavier back. Of course, you need to follow local regulations. There may be already uh, slot limits or length limits. But beyond that, throw the bigger fish back and eat the small ones. There's a lot more of them. You're not going to deplete them. And you're putting something back that will give somebody some pleasure hooking it later on. That's Keith Sutton with some good advice for you catfish anglers. And that's also today's Wired to Fish Radio. I'm Wade Bourne saying thanks for listening and get outside. Thanks, Wade. And now we go from catfish to tuna. We have Captain Dave Carrara with us. He is captain of the tuna.com it's a boat off of gloucester and he's one of the stars of the national geographic uh, reality series called wicked tuna first of all captain dave welcome to the show good morning thanks for having me on you're the best tuna captain out there just be you and me right <laughs> if you say so that's i've watched the show and to me that's that's pretty clear you know you're the one that's never complaining about everybody else uh, we do all right. We fish hard. You know, <clears throat> keep in mind, you're only seeing a handful of boats, five boats. There's a good, you know, two, three hundred up and down the coast, and uh, there's a lot more guys that are a lot better than I am, you know. But, uh, you know, we, we do catch quite a few fish every year, no doubt about that, and uh, we'll do it again this year. Name a few guys that are better than you are. <laughs> oh, man, there's uh, – <laughs> I can go through a pretty pretty long list. But, uh, you know, they're, they're like, there's, there's, there's about two to three hundred boats – and out of all the quota that we get, 10% of those guys that are good catch 90% of the quota. Wow. That, that, that's, kind of, that's kind of the way it is with any kind of fishing. You know, the top 10% catch 90% of fish, you know, whether it's bass or tuna or trout, that's how it is, right? Absolutely. And it's not luck. A lot of people say you're just lucky. That's right. You, know, you, you can only get lucky every so often, but, you know, what it comes down to, it comes down to perseverance, hard work, dedication, and skill. Exactly. So what what are the skills you need to, to be a good to an angler? <clears throat> well, it's uh, lots of time, paying attention to detail, and uh, being versatile. I mean, it's just, I've had, I've had several deckhands come on the boat for a few years, and then they move on. Then they go fish with somebody else, or they buy their own boat, and they never catch another fish again. Right. Either you get it or you don't. That's Either you're fishy or you're not fishy. Ex- exactly. You know, it's almost like you're born with a sense or you don't have it. <laughs> that, that's that's exactly correct. How does a captain really make a difference? You know, I mean, you, you obviously you own the boat, you take the financial risks, but w- what else do you have to do? You've you got to kind of have a feel for what the fish are doing, right? Sure. I mean, abs- absolutely. You know, it's from everything from leaving the dock to having the boat ready to go. You know, to when you pull out of the dock, do you go north, south, do you go east? Right. When you get there, what baits do you fish? What depth do you put them at? If I can say so, one of the things I noticed about you is you have the the work ethic, for lack of a better word, to go the extra mile, you know, to, to do the extra thing that, that, that the others aren't doing. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, the, I run a tight ship, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's a clean boat. Right. And, uh, you know, we do things, you know, a certain way. And, you know, I mean, I'm not putting the other guys down, but, you know, you could definitely see a difference in our boat compared to, to most boats. No right. doubt about it. Uh, what what kind of airplanes do you fly? <laughs> I fly for, uh, for for JetBlue. We fly the Airbus, the A320, and we fly the uh, the Embraer 190. Uh, they're uh, 150 and 100 passenger, respectively. So you're, you're an honest-to-gosh airline pilot, right? Yes, yep. I've How about been doing that? it since 19. I graduated the academy in 1992, okay. and I've been doing it since. Next time I fly JetBlue, I'll look you up. <laughs> <laughs> are, are you in the off season right now, or, or what are you doing? Right now, no, I'm just uh, flying a little bit and uh, doing a lot of skiing. This is my time to relax. So I'm going to start fishing here in about another uh, about another four to five weeks. So where do you go when, when you go skiing? I got a house up here at, uh, in Loon Mountain, New Hampshire. Really? I'm here about yeah, three to five days a week. 
so you don't go to Aspen or something like that. You you stay I, you stay I, actually, local. Yeah, I used to live out in Colorado for five years, and uh, I was out in Utah for the last five years. I just I just bought this house up here last January, so I got tired of commuting back and forth. So I'll, I'll be staying here from now on. It's an easy two hour drive from my home in Gloucester. Do you think catching tuna, especially the bluefin, is getting harder in comparison to years ago? I. It's hard to say. I mean, I've had, I've had, not 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 speaking for this season, but the, you know, the last two and three, those were my best years ever. Really. So I mean, I'm not, I'm not. There's definitely not as many fish here in the Gloucester area in the Gulf of Maine as there has been. Yep. And I, I'm not saying that there's no fish left, but the bait, the bait population has been decimated. And if there's no, if there's no bait, there's no food. The fish move on. Right. Most of the fish that were here years ago you know, in big, big numbers, are all up in Canada. Canada has now seen numbers of bluefin tuna that they have not seen in decades. We're out of time, unfortunately, uh, Captain Dave. But would you come back again? And I'd like to talk to you just some more about the herring, tuna chase, and everything like that. All yeah, right? Abso- absolutely. Okay, you you take care, and good skiing, all right? All right, thanks, Alec. <laughs> take care. All right, you take care. Bye-bye. And, folks, we'll be back next time on Outdoors This Week. Bye-bye. Alex Langer, Outdoors This Week.